All right, today we're going to be diving into a Web3 project out there. And of course, as you guys know, we try to do this from time to time. And today will be an interview with a founder and CEO. So it's going to be a good one. Stick around. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. Joining me today is Luke Barakowski, who is coming in from Pixels. Great to have you, Luke. How's it going? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's been a busy time at Pixels the last couple months, but it's kind of easing now. So now we can kind of focus on what's up for the next year. Um, yeah. but excited to be here today. So let's get into it a little bit. I just want to let our audience know a little bit about Pixels as a project. If you can kind of give maybe someone that's just brand new to Web3 and understanding what's happening uh, a rundown on Pixels. Yeah, so at Pixels, I would say that we love Web3 gaming and we are a Web3 native game at the core of it. Now, we also really care about gameplay and we love what we're building here when it comes to the core gameplay loops. But what we've tried to figure out is what are the unique parts of Web3 that actually make gameplay better? So if you've been following Pixels or if you don't know anything about Pixels, we take a pretty different approach to a lot of game studios and how we actually go and build this game. We actually released the first version of Pixels about two years ago. And how the game kind of looks and plays now is it plays like Stardew Valley if it was an MMO. I yeah. have a big fondness for uh, casual games and I love games like Farmville. So we took inspiration from those initial games at the very beginning of what we were doing. But we released the game two years ago and we have been building with community for over two years now. So the game's evolved a ton in the last two years. First version of the yeah. game that came out in like January, 2022, wasn't very good, um, but it's gotten better and better. And one of the things that we've been trying to figure out at Pixels is what are the elements of Web3 that make gaming actually interesting? So it's actually become quite an interesting like hodgepodge of a lot of different Web3 mechanics because we've been trying things a lot. So it's really interoperable. That's one of the first things you'll notice when you come and play Pixels where we do this cool thing of NFT avatar integrations. We've worked it over 90 nft collections to this point we put them inside of the game to use them as avatars inside of our game so you'll notice when you first come into our game there's like a lot of different characters inside of it because it's actually all nfts that we didn't release that you can actually use inside of the game as an avatar and that's one of those first things when you see pixels it kind of starts to click in your mind oh this is an interesting part about web3 like there's all these other things inside of Web3 that we're combining into this one experience. And we've continued to build with this approach. One of the things that we've honed in on now is the play to earn mechanics, which mm -hmm. is an interesting one because play to earn became really popular about two years ago with Axie Infinity. And it's one of those things that you know took the world by storm for a short period of time, kind of went back into the back burner. And now you know we're trying to come back with play to earn again. Now, play to earn maybe didn't work as well the first time, but we kind of believe that it's the future of how games will evolve and actually most games will be play to earn in like the next five to 10 years. We kind of view it as the evolution of gaming where, you know, 10 years ago, you used to only buy games. You would pay like, if you were even on the iPhone, you would pay like five to $10 right. for a download of the game. Yeah. Then free to play came out. And we think that play to earn is kind of the next evolution of gaming user acquisition. So we've done a lot of work in there. We just launched a token about two months ago. And that was really the big kickoff for us. And that, you know, got us a lot more attention inside of the Web3 space. Sure. And sure. yeah, we're experimenting a lot with how you can use tokens to grow games in ways that you couldn't do it in Web2. And that's a lot of been, that's been a lot of our core tech too, kind of figuring out, you know, how tokens are used, what part about Web3 is interesting, how you can make a really competitive game experience against Web2, and really leaning into the interesting parts of Web3. I want to get into some of the mechanics behind this, because this obviously gets into how games will uh, fare you know, from a sustainability standpoint, meaning how long will they last. Uh, one of the things, of course, that was big news is um, you guys shifting over from Polygon to Ronin uh, within that with that move, I guess, why did you move, first of all? And also kind of as a follow-on, is how much of Pixels is still on Polygon and not on Ronin? So Web3 is still in a really early spot where nobody really knows what's going to work and what's not going to work. And what we do know inside of Web3 is user acquisition is very difficult and it's very expensive. So we were built on Polygon for a while and I have a lot of love for what Polygon's doing. I have a lot of respect for that team. I have nothing negative to say about Polygon. But what we were looking for with a partnership with the chain was somebody who could help us with user acquisition and distribution in a way yeah. that didn't really exist for us on Polygon. And working with the Ronin team was really attractive to me because 
really, they were the only team who had experience scaling a Web3 game before. And right. that is not an easy thing to do. And scaling a Web3 game is very, very difficult. And it comes with a lot of lessons learned as well, too. So I really wanted to work with somebody who had kind of been there and done that before. And yeah, Ronan, the Sky Mavis team, um, yeah. they had scaled Axie Infinity. And you know, I had my own criticisms of Axie Infinity before I joined Web3 and got into the space. But as I started building in Web3, I developed a much deeper sense of empathy with, with the people who came before us, essentially. And I started to realize yeah, sure. how difficult it is to build in the space and what the lessons learned in that space actually give you and how valuable it could be to work with a team who's done it before. So part of the reason why we wanted to move with to Ronin was that mentorship aspect, and it's been invaluable. I can't speak enough on knowledge of that team, what they bring to the table, and you know how smart that team is. And then the other yeah. thing is obviously the distribution aspect too. So they had already done the hard work of onboarding millions and millions of users onto the Ronin chain. And though Axie DAU might have been down when we initially moved there, our bet was that we could probably resurrect a lot of these users who had already been onboarded into the Ronin chain because really the onboarding part is the hard, expensive part. Yeah, and it I was would, a bet. I would it was argue a that though, in the sense that uh, Axie was the early mover in web3 but at the same time we saw a large amount of people abandon that game you know as many more competitive competitive games came to market and obviously the multi-chain capacity you know uh, would would you be trading off you know the existing potential uh, of what's happening over on the polygon network and also some of the interoperability by going into axie well into ronin uh, with more of a closed chain ecosystem. Just think of that as a, a trade-off, you know, for you guys at Pixels. Yeah, so we had talked to basically every chain and really considered the options before we moved over to Ronin. And again, just like building in the space, I had this deep understanding of the value that actually meant to onboard those initial users at the beginning. Um, and the reality is Ronin had gamers on the chain and no other chain sure. had that. There might have been some DeFi or some other aspects on top of these games, but otherwise, if we were moving down the other chain, it would really be us, you know, creating more users or more gamers on top of that chain. So there was really good mutual benefit for us moving to Ronin because they already had these gamers onboarded. And the bet that we were making was, okay, can we start to re-turn on some of these users? And it was one of those things before we moved, I got a lot of pushback from different stakeholders yeah. or mentors or other people in the space. But now that we've made that move, I don't think anybody's criticized it on our end, is what I can say. Interesting. Uh, okay, so with the fact that it's not, uh, Pixels may not be on Magic Eden or on OpenSea, I'm just looking at, and I think about, you know, just the farmland side of things. How will that progress? I mean, if this continues to move as it migrates onto Ronin, will this disappear from OpenSea? I know OpenSea, one of your investors, but is this something that will continue to operate within the OpenSea and potentially Magic Eden communities? How, how will that transact? So generally what we saw with our Farmland NFT is the engagement of our own player base is what's driving the volume on these exchanges. Mm -hmm. And really we wanna be where our players are when we think about the you know, NFT and any of the large assets that we hold. Um, so I also, when I think about NFTs and on-chain assets, I like to think about them in different tiers and categories. And I think there are benefits to having some assets on the L1, on ETH, and then other assets that are, you know, they have less need for liquidity or cross-game right. functionality, right. essentially, to be on a chain like Ronin or an L2 or even an L3. So our farmland NFT is one of those ones where... You know, it hasn't actually happened yet, but we'd love to see more interoperability from other games to our NFT farmland. And leaving it on ETH leaves that option where we have like a two-way bridge to Ronin and OpenSea. So we don't close that door if, you know, other people actually want to use our assets inside of their games. Um, and, you know, we still maintain optionality where if people do really feel like it's better to be on ETH, they can have it on there. Our token is the same way. Um, the Pixel token is on ETH and it's on Ronin you see a lot of exchange volume on the L1s, but also all of our users use it mostly on Ronin. In, in terms of the, because you keep mentioning the users, I'm looking at token terminal here on, uh, on Ronin in general with, uh, with what's happening here. And if you look at the transaction count versus say uh, users uh, being active users daily, um, 
I mean, first of all, the, the, the fact that, you know, mainly our active users is going up, but daily transactions not necessarily, or transaction count, I should say, is going up as much, considering this many players that potentially are on the network. Um, why do you think there's such a disparity in, in that uh, right now within the network versus uh, transactions? That's actually better ecosystem health, in my opinion, because that means that most of the tokens are staying inside of the game. So we do some things on chain, we do some things off chain. We used to have a, when I first joined Web3, I had this mindset that everything needs to be decentralized, everything needs to be on chain. And we actually had almost all of the ownership of our game assets on chain. That means like literally every single farm that people, right. or every single crop that people farmed was on chain. One day when we had that, it broke and it was broke for like four or five days and none of our users noticed and they didn't care basically. So what we found is there are certain still running things inside people, game. Yeah. So you're exactly, right. exactly. So there are certain things that people want on chain and we actually don't need things on chain until the last minute. A lot of the times mm -hmm. when people want to take particular actions, like sell the token or sell an NFT, yep. that's when they need it on chain. But until then, it doesn't really need to be on chain. Um, as long as you're giving people transparency into like some of the statistics they want, there's some value in having like maybe marketplace volume on chain. But honestly, we have people that made third party tools with yeah, our sure. APIs where they get 90% of the value as it would be on chain. And it saves us so much time and complexity, all this too. So yeah, you might not be seeing all these transactions on chain with a pixel token, but it's because it's happening in game or they're keeping their tokens in game, which is actually okay. better for the system. With the with the fact of uh, interoperability on chain, you know, kind of being a big deal, I think for most Web three projects, obviously this will start to isolate pixels into Ronin because you know it's not a chain that is interoperable with others. Um, with that being the case, do you feel like that is going to be, you know, a deterrent for growth, or do you feel like no, this is this is going to be a huge ecosystem? We're going to have uh, a very centralized player network here that's going to be able to piggyback on what Ronin has built. And uh, we're going to continue to see that chain just become the dominant out there. W what's your opinion? Yeah, so we've done so many experiments with interoperability at this point, and we still read from other chains. So we actually do read Polygon NFTs inside of our game right now, where if, I don't think we support that many, because again, I don't want to say anything bad, but like there's really not that much NFT activity inside of Polygon, right. yeah. where it makes sense for us to put a lot of resources into creating interoperable experiences with the activity there. Um, but we still support like 80 something NFT collections on ETH. The interesting thing is Pixels is at the size right now where interoperability isn't really a huge growth driver for us. It's something fun and it brought, provides value to the users. But whenever you work with an NFT collection, like specifically like a 10K PFP collection, really there's maybe like three to 400 active users inside of those NFT collections. And then maybe you'll convert like 10 to 20% on a good day with these NFT collections. So it's like, it's not a huge um, lift. So we do like the idea of like deeper interoperability with maybe larger ecosystems, but it's funny because okay. we're in a spot right now where we drive most of our own user growth and we move most people to wherever we go, essentially. Where, where does that user growth come from? So it's in the incentive design. And that's a lot of the work that we've been figuring out. So I love play to earn. And I love thinking about creating incentives that help our users help us grow. The key thesis Do you feel like that's been is, like word of mouth or, or has it been, you know, just the relationship with Ronin or, or what is it? Social? What, what's driving it though? I'm just kind of yeah, so we've experimented with a bunch. Um, we've run some campaigns where we really turn on the growth inside of our own ecosystem. That means things like incentivized sharing, incentivized referrals, all of this. And we've done that in short bursts. So we ran the first play to airdrop. It's funny because play to airdrop is this whole new meta now. We were the ones that coined that term and we did this in like August 2022. Um, so we've been on top of the meta and like kind of setting some of the meta like that. Um, so we think about incentivized growth in those ways. And then we also think about um, literally just creating incentive structures that help our users help us grow. Okay. So we have been growing organically since we've had the token out, um, but it's because of these incentive structures that we place inside right. the game and some of the play to earn mechanics, they're inherently viral. Um, yeah. Axie Infinity, they didn't really put that much had, money in yeah, the market. Yeah, they had very similar. Yeah, you're right. They had a very similar mm -hmm. 
uh, scenario play out for them. Uh, I want to play a clip for you. This is Yatsu, obviously of Animoca Brands, and he's talking a little bit more around the Mochaverse. I want to get your opinion on this. Let me uh, play this clip for you. Pixels was was a you know an interesting game on a on a new blockchain, and we bought you know I don't know how many people you Mochaverse bought into it, but you know it's about a third of the traffic came in from is it? from really from Mochaverse. Yeah, okay. Mochaverse has risen in value, but you will notice very few NFTs are actually on sale. Versus maybe some NFT collections that have much more liquidity, but also yeah. they're held by a more degen community that actually trading. And you kind of need both, right? You know, um, yeah. companies like Sky, Sky Mavis have demonstrated with Axie Infinity, um, you know, and, and Ronin, of course, that you need a healthy mix of, you know, both to create a market. I mean, yeah. if you want to build North Korea, go ahead, right? You know, then you don't yeah. open, don't you have a market, right? But then why are you yeah. in Web3 to begin with? I mean, <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's a, there's no point yeah. being in Web3 if you're building a closed ecosystem. Okay, so you kind of see, you know, Yatsu's point right there. What what were your thoughts about that? Yeah, so there's, I would say there's a few partnerships inside of Web3 right now that are like difference makers when we're thinking about like the scale that we have, because we have 700,000 daily active addresses playing the game, probably like 500,000 real daily active users, probably more about 600,000 now. And Mochaverse is one of those projects where, you know, I'm really bought into the vision of them. And yeah, it was like a win-win for both of us, essentially. Yeah. We drove a ton of users to them. They drove a lot of users to us too. And as more and more people come into the space, then it starts getting more interesting for us when it comes to deeper interoperability yeah. as well. Okay. The Mochaverse integration with us was like a cool one because it wasn't just an NFT integration. It was a very deep integration where there was gameplay. There was like shared rewards between both ecosystems. And we love that stuff, mm -hmm. but it has to be like moving the needle for us to do it right now. Oh, no doubt. You've got to have these partnerships really resolve into some sort of you know advancement for the project. In terms of mobile, you know, and you look at what mobile has been able to do, Axie not launching on iOS, uh, what's the plan for Pixels? How, what's the mobile roadmap for you guys? Yeah, so we work in mobile browsers right now, and about 30% of our user base plays in mobile browsers. In browser. So when okay. we think about, yeah, when we think about actually mobile native, it's still not an easy path to get a Web3 game yeah. into the App Store. And yep. truthfully, our strategy is probably companion apps or secondary apps that aren't core Pixels gameplay, but maybe like we've been talking a lot about what does it look like when we start to scale horizontally? Um, and when do we start pulling the trigger on that? We're probably planting the seeds on that now, but like you could probably expect us to release some casual games that aren't okay. necessarily directly related to Pixels, but mobile friendly, like iOS native, um, yeah. and then likely using the token, but in a different way potentially. Yeah, well, I could see that being kind of a marketing ploy because obviously you're going to get to more gamers being able to pull them into you know the browser side of things. But onboarding is still an issue that I think we're going to continue to see in Web3. What do you think is going to be kind of the holy grail for what you guys are doing now that you're on the Ronin chain in terms of onboarding? Yeah, I have a maybe controversial take here where, again, Axie okay. Infinity, when it really started scaling, the onboarding experience was so much worse than what the Ronin network is now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they still got millions of users. If there's a compelling enough reason for people to be you know, coming into a Web3 ecosystem, then I don't think onboarding is as big of an issue. And I don't think the Web3 so you feel space it's good is good enough now. Yet. You feel I think like it's, it's good, good enough. enough now. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. I like that because uh, that you know most people are trying to perfect that onboarding experience. But you're right, there is there's a lot of players. I think that especially if you get into Gen Z, that are one much more digitally native. They they kind of understand the process of kind of coming on, you know. And I think you know anybody that's been around crypto is probably already down that road as well. All right, so uh, I guess the next question I want to get into um, you you for you guys, it's going to be the Ronin wallet. So all of your users, you're really promoting the fact that they would gr get a Ronin wallet. Is that kind of the, the process here? So we have social login inside of the game too. And I think okay. about like 20% of users initially sign up with a social login. But then oh, okay. in order to interact with the like Web3 components, you're going to need to get a wallet essentially. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of the idea where we want a flow into the game that doesn't necessarily require it, but you're going to get more of the game experience once you onboard into crypto. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at the login and sign up uh, there on your site. Uh, I think this is cool. I think the the key here is as we start to see Web3 Gaming really become a major category, which is really starting now. I think this year, and I've said it many times, I think 24 is the breakout year for it, whether we get a big breakout game or just 
a lot of these games, much like what you guys are doing, starting to really grow. Roadmap wise, uh, for chapter two, what's it look like down, say, across the next 12 months? Yeah, so I would say we have one KPI when it comes to all the things we're thinking about over the next 12 to 24 months, and it's really increasing spend inside of the ecosystem. It okay. sounds all weird right. to say that when I'm talking about players, but um, monetization is actually really important for sustainability inside of Web3 Gaming. And when we think a lot about the economics of the business model, it revolves around basically you know, creating more interesting gameplay that leads to spend, which you can then funnel back into user acquisition or things like play to earn, all of this. So yeah. chapter two is our big initiative with changing some of the economics inside of the game. Um, there's a lot of complexities when you start to release a Web3 game when it comes to reward distribution. And our chapter two is partly in when we think about releasing it, one way to get more rewards to better users inside of the game. Mm -hmm. We're essentially adding more progression. The game's gonna feel a lot more like a traditional MMO when it comes to progression, yeah. tiering, all this kind of stuff. And then we're also thinking about more monetization rails inside of the game as well too. So right now, really the monetization that we have inside of Pixels, you can buy a VIP pass, which is a subscription. It's about like 10 US dollars a month. Um, we do a couple mints every now and then. You can buy coins inside of the game. We're going to start giving our users more reasons to be able to use the token inside of the game in Chapter 2 and yeah. add it into progression. And it's kind of a similar way to how a game like Clash of Clans monetizes, where it's not supposed mm -hmm. to interfere with core gameplay, but it makes the gameplay a bit better for the people who want to be participating in that. And then, yeah, we also think the game's just going to be a lot more interesting when we release Chapter 2 as well. It introduces a lot more social dynamics. We have guilds tightly integrated into the gameplay. And we're really excited about it. It's the best I felt about our gameplay, the plan around it, and what we're about to do. And That's it's cool. an exciting time. Yeah. What about, uh, you know, when you look at just the creator economy, much ha that has been built, I, I would say Sandbox is a good example of that. But, you know, the opportunity here with what Axie has done with gaming guilds, we've seen the expansion now. You've got the Ronin Network really starting to move into multiple game, uh, now really kind of become, become a game network. Um, and you look at the creator economy, is that something that will apply to Pixels as well? Yeah, that's somewhat of the intention behind guilds too. What we think a lot about is how do we create incentive structures natively inside of the game that reward people for helping us grow. And yeah. we've done some things like referrals or like incentivized content creation. We love the idea of guilds because it basically creates this new incentive structure where if you are a group of users, you're incentivized to go help grow your own subgroup of users inside of this ecosystem. Also, the social connection makes the retention a lot stickier and it makes the gameplay like just feel a bit better too. So yeah, there's some interesting aspects with the guild system that we're creating. If you haven't followed along, how our guilds kind of work is it's Socialfy-ish, where it feels a little bit like friend tech meets web three gaming. Oh, okay. where yeah. Yeah, if you uh, purchase a membership into a guild, you actually have to buy a membership with a Pixel token. Um, part of that membership, it's taken out as a fee and distributed back to the guild. So they actually get a little bit of a treasury to go and do whatever they want with that's it. That's nice. Um, yeah. Hopefully some user acquisition. <laughs> well, th that's some good strategies, you know, because I think that's one of the things that is and has been missing with a lot of Web3 projects is just the economy strategies being built into it. We've learned a lot, you know, from the Axie Infinity days you know, of really understanding how to get into, uh, you know, reducing fees, increasing player volume, and then obviously really kind of get that, um, that stickiness or that viral nature of games. So definitely going to be one to watch. Uh, Luke, it's been great having you on the show. Thanks so much for uh, stopping in today. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. You bet. All right, so you guys are, are tuned in here. And if you like these kind of uh, Web3 project breakdowns, whether it's games or other st styles of projects out there around Web3. Make sure and drop some comments down below. We always love to get your feedback. Of course, if you're not following me on X, make sure and do that. It's just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.